The book of Ezekiel, chapter 30, with a word of wisdom from our Father, in Jesus' name, verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, How ye woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen, the time of the nations, the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled at the seventh trumpet, the time of the Gentiles concerning the sixth trumpet. So there are three woe trumpets. You see this word woe in the second verse, the woe of the fifth trumpet being the emergence of that one world political system of which Egypt is a type here, Egypt being symbolic of bondage. Then it's wounded to death by a sword after which you have the woe of the sixth trumpet when Satan appears as the false Christ. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, the woe of the seventh trumpet, which is the return of the true Christ, and the day of the Lord begins. So this concerns that day of the Lord beginning and the five months just prior to that, the three woe trumpets. And you have three swords to take into consideration, the sword that the deadly wound is carried out with, the sword of man, the sword of war, the sword that comes out of Satan's mouth, which is the deception, the opposite of the sword that comes out of the mouth of the true Christ who returns at the seventh trumpet. So a threefold meaning here, and the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, being killed spiritually at the sixth trumpet, and all flesh being done away with at the seventh, and they shall take away her multitude, and her foundation shall be broken down." Ethiopia and Libya, which you also see in Ezekiel 38, and Lydia, and all the mingled people, and Cub, and the men of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. Remember that league written of in Daniel chapter 11. In verses 21 through 30, you have that first half hour of the five-month-long hour of temptation concerning the political beast, which is wounded to death by a sword, as it's written in Revelation 13, then Satan appears as the false Christ. In Jerusalem, which is spiritually called in Revelation 11, both Sodom and Egypt, symbolic of bondage there. Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia goes back to Genesis chapter 10, and the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mitzrayim, which is Egypt, and Put, which is Libya. This word Lydia here comes from Lud, and Lud was from Shem, but South Africa is in the bottom of the continent. South Africa being part of the Commonwealth, geographically speaking, but as far as spiritually speaking here, who was Cush? He was the father of Nimrod, who was the type of Antichrist who built the first one world system of this world age. So see the symbolism within this with the Tower of Babel being brought into it, if you break this back to Genesis chapter 10 and 11. Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt, that's Mitzrayim, one of the sons of Ham, the uncle of Nimrod, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down. From the Tower of Syene shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. Again, a threefold meaning the deadly wound by a sword to the one world system, the sword of deception that kills a third spiritually at the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial, and then the sword that comes out of the mouth of the true Christ at the seventh vial. And they shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. The desolator is Satan's role of Antichrist. And her city shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted at the seventh trumpet. The evil rudiments of the world, including this one world system that Egypt is a type of, are destroyed, as we know from Second Peter chapter 3, as well as Revelation 19.20. The beast and the false prophet destroyed in the lake of fire. Satan's one world system, as well as his role of antichrist. And they shall know that I am the Lord, our heavenly Father, is God, and no one else, when I have set a fire in Egypt, and when her helpers shall be destroyed. In that day shall messengers go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid, and great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. Now what are these ships, and what is the subject here? Again, the day of the Lord is what this is looking forward to. The ships of Chittim being God's election that are written of in the 44th chapter of this book of Ezekiel. During the millennium, they'll teach discipline. 
to those that were deceived so that they'll stand against Satan, hopefully at the end of the thousand years and go into the eternity, the third world age. These ships being those highly polished spectrum metal vehicles written of in the first chapter of this book of Ezekiel, the ships of Chittim in the millennium. You also have the two witnesses involved with the five month long hour of temptation. So you have to figure them into the equation, and one of them is most likely Elijah, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, and you see one of those vehicles written of in Second Kings when Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind in one of those highly polished spectrum metal vehicles. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon. Now we're talking about the woe of the sixth trumpet when Satan appears as the false Christ. He and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, shall be brought to destroy, which is one of Satan's names, the destroyer, the land. And they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. They'll slay a third spiritually with the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which issues out of their mouths. The people with the king of Babylon of the end times, which is Satan, are Satan's locust army, his fallen angels, which have vehicles as well, as it's written in Revelation 9. And I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste and all that is therein by the hand of strangers, I the Lord have spoken it. What is this rivers running dry? The Euphrates runs dry at the sixth vial, which is whenever Satan appears, the king of Babylon in the future ascents. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols, and I will cause their images to cease out of Noph, and there shall be no more a prince in the land of Egypt. And I will put a fear in the land of Egypt, Noph being Memphis, which is in Egypt, and this looking forward to the woe of the seventh trumpet. And I will make Pathros desolate, and will set fire in Zoan, and will execute judgments in No. And I will pour my fury upon Sin in the Egyptian Delta, and this is a type of what is future. Sin, the strength of Egypt, God will pour out those vials of wrath upon his enemies. He's not going to pour them out on those that love him. And I will cut off the multitude of No, Haman No. Remember in Exodus that the Israelites were there, but were they harmed by the plagues? Were they raptured away before the plagues were poured out upon the Egyptians of old? No, there's no such thing as the rapture. That's one of the traditions of men and a deception of Satan. And I will set fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain and no shall be rent asunder and Noph shall have distresses daily. The young men of Avon and Pibaseth shall fall by the sword and the city shall go into captivity. Again, a threefold meaning of this word sword as well as captivity. The captivity of a one world political system at first that's wounded by a sword, which is militarily, or better said, politically, because all it would take to wound it to death would be for one of the nations involved to pull out of it. Most likely that's how it happens, but we don't know. That's supposition. The captivity after that is the captivity of the mind that comes with receiving the mark of the beast, which is the deception that Jesus has returned at the sixth trumpet. But it's actually going to be Satan, the king of Babylon. Babylon means confusion. And then the captivity at the seventh trumpet is the captivity to Almighty God that God's election are already in. At Tehaphanes, also the day shall be darkened, when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt, and the pomp of her strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her, a cloud of people, as you know from the book of Revelation, the armies of heaven at the seventh trumpet. But at the sixth trumpet, you have a cloud of locusts, the locust army, the consumer stage of it. Also with this geographic location, Tehaphanes, which is where in the 1800s the archaeologist Petri discovered Kasser el Bent Yehudai documenting the time in Egypt of Zedekiah's daughters. That means the palace of the daughter of Judah. Jeremiah took the king's daughters into Egypt and then Great Britain. And there we have the scepter of Judah to this day, fulfilling Genesis chapter 49, in part until Shiloh come, until the true Christ returns. So again, connecting Egypt to the royal house in Great Britain which will be part of the lion in Daniel chapter 11 of this one world system. It has the mouth like the mouth of a lion. 
the bear of Daniel 7 being Edom, which means red, the communistic ingredient. But within that, you also have Ishmael, the Islamic nations. Remember, Esau married one of the daughters of Ishmael in the book of Genesis. And so that ties Esau into this analogy of Egypt as a scale model for the one world government, with the leopard symbolic of the Kenites' four hidden dynasties being self-explanatory with their blatant use of the Egyptian pyramids, signifying a new order of the ages, a one world government symbolized here by Egypt. Both the political in the first two and a half months that's wounded by a sword, the deadly wound that's healed by the woe of the sixth trumpet when Satan appears as the false Christ. Then it becomes a religious one world system still symbolized by Egypt. As we know from Revelation 11, Jerusalem is called both Sodom and Egypt. Egypt is symbolic of bondage politically and spiritually. Thus will I execute judgments in Egypt, and they shall know that I am the Lord. They're going to know the difference between the true father and the fake father at the seventh trumpet, when all are changed into spiritual bodies in that day. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now we're up to about four months before the fall of Jerusalem, historically speaking, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's his strength, his power. And lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed, to put a roller, a bandage, that is to say, to bind it, to make it strong, to hold the sword. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong, and that which was broken, both arms, and I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and will disperse them through the countries. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and put my sword in his hand. But I will break Pharaoh's arms, and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. Again, a deadly wound by a sword, after which Satan slays a third of mankind with the sword that comes out of his mouth. So you got three swords here and three woes concerning the five-month-long hour of temptation and the one world government. Satan heals the wound, so to speak, but is that really healing the wound, spiritually speaking, by killing a third of them? No. It's a figure of speech, which means that the opposition to the one world system will cease because they'll think that Christ has returned. But wounded to death they are, spiritually speaking, especially those who don't snap out of it between the sixth and seventh trumpets. God's elect will be delivered up at that time, and because of what God will say through his election, there's the sword of the Lord, the word of God. Many shall come out of confusion, come out of Babylon, that is to say, and take part in the first resurrection, in the day of the Lord, which begins at the woe of the seventh trumpet. That's when the true Christ returns, as it's written in Revelation chapter 19, starting with verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God." And the armies which were in heaven, these are the clouds, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That would look like a cloud, wouldn't it? A cloud of people, the armies which were in heaven. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. This is the time of the Gentiles, the times of the nations being fulfilled whenever they're judged. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus, the true Jesus, the true Christ, returning at the seventh trumpet, and not until then. But that day shall not come until the son of perdition, Satan, that is to say, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, Satan in the future sense, as the false Christ, and put my sword in his hand. God is causing this to happen. He's allowing Satan to appear as the false Christ to test his children because of what happened in the first world age. But I will break Pharaoh's arms, and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. But I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down, and they shall know that 
I am the Lord. At the seventh trumpet, they're going to know that our Father is God and that Satan was impersonating Jesus. And they're going to want the mountains and rocks to fall on them and cover them out of shame, too ashamed to face the true Christ upon his return. When I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries, and they shall know that I am the Lord. At the seventh trumpet, the last trump written of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15.